And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome to Open Connection, I'm your host, Robert Picto. According to the Center of Disease Control, children and adolescents ages 6 through 17 should do 60 minutes or more of moderate to vigorous, intense physical activity each day. On today's Open Connection, we open our archives to bring you this story from 1989. Going to school. It's something virtually every Canadian is familiar with. For most of us, the better part of 12 years is spent going to school. It's an exceedingly important function where we learn skills that will be used throughout our lives. Not only the educational skills, such as reading and arithmetic, but also the social skills, making friends, and learning to live successfully with other people in an integrated society. Those goals of the education system haven't changed over the years, but the way those goals are reached has seen a great deal of change. And so while the school buildings look much like they always have, what goes on inside them often bears little resemblance to activities of even a few years ago. It's just after 8.30 in the morning and students at Pine Ridge Elementary School in Prince Rupert are arriving for the morning's classes. Now the first order of business in many BC schools used to be the Lord's Prayer, but that's no longer mandatory. And then, as I recall, after that came the morning's exercises, the mental exercises, right down and into the books. But students here at Pine Ridge begin their day in a different sort of way with a different sort of exercise, physical exercise. In most schools at this time of the morning, classrooms would be abuzz with activity, but at Pine Ridge Elementary, the classrooms are empty. The students are making their way to the gymnasium. The first lesson of the day is an exercise not so much for the mind, but rather for the heart, aerobic exercise. For a year now, the 400 students at Pine Ridge have been starting their school day with 15 minutes of aerobic exercise. The program was started by a teacher who in the evenings is an aerobics instructor. The teacher knew the benefits that come from a daily physical workout, and it didn't take much to convince the school principal to agree to the aerobics program. I guess the thing that really startled us was that um, they, they find that by the age of 14, that's when kids reach their, their peak for the whole life of physical fitness, and then it's downhill from there, and, and that's pretty frightening. And then the paradox here is that adults are into a, a real fitness craze, but they, the kids seem to be left behind, so... It's something that we can work on here in the school. Um, you know, school is a place for children to learn how to go on through life, and I think it's important at an early age to establish an attitude towards physical fitness and health, and uh, what better place than in the elementary school. Everybody gets into the aerobics act, including the principal. The older students help out, leading the classes, as do the teachers. The aerobics program doesn't replace the regular physical education classes, and there are six different routines, just to keep it interesting. And although most of the kids like the aerobics, not all are enthusiastic. I don't like them. Why not? <laughs> because they're not fun. They're not? What would you rather do, read a book? Go home and play. I enjoy them because um, by the time gym, time gym time comes, I'm sort of like ready for gym and I can run around faster in gym and I'm ready for it. So I actually enjoy aerobics. Is it good for any other reason besides getting ready for gym time? Yeah, it gets your body in shape and um, gets you ready and takes sort of away the stress, some of the stress of the day and helps you. You guys got a lot of stress during the day? Well, sometimes, yeah. yeah. You get stressed? Sometimes. Aerobics helps that out? Just a little. Yes, just a little. Better than doing arithmetic? Yeah. Yes. This aerobic exercise is a little bit harder, so this one's good. But some but, of the ones are easier. Yeah, we should have a lot more exercise, because, I don't know. <laughs> so do the programs change, then? Yeah. About every two weeks, we get a different one. Yeah. And you like the hard ones? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. What's so good about them? Well, you can concentrate more on your work because you get rid of all your excess energy and you don't kick under your desk and that. 
and you just feel good after you've done them. They don't put you to sleep because you're all tired out. No. <laughs> the physical benefits that come from a regular exercise program are well known. And the kids are also right when they mention the mental benefits that come from the aerobics. They may very well help relieve stress. And the principal says a brisk round of exercise first thing in the morning perks the students up, gets them mentally prepared for their academic lessons. Yeah, th this has been real uh, sort of a spin-off benefit is that uh, we do this 15 minutes a day, and so people might say, well, gee, that's 15 minutes out of instructional time. But we get more ins learning and instruction out of the kids. Uh, a teacher who came here this year, she's been teaching 12 years, and said, she said that uh, she's never had a class so alert and responsive. They're just up and ready to go. Teachers themselves have um, said their physical fitness has improved. They have higher teacher energy throughout the day. So that's a real, a real bonus. Uh, to us. And something else, too, the, the teachers get a quick read on their kids in the morning. When they come in, they can see if, if they're listless or out of sorts in the aerobics, and so it sort of gives them a, a line on the kids for the day as to how to approach them and, and draw them out. So they get a quick read in the morning on how their kids are for the day. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thank you for staying with us. French Immersion Programming benefits the cognitive and social development of students as well as their opportunities for career advancement. Let us return to archives to learn more about Prince Rupert's French Immersion Program. Come on, say. With the aerobics over, the students begin their regular classes. For most in the Prince Rupert School District, the lessons are conducted in English, but a growing number of kids are taught in French. The French Immersion Program was established several years ago, mostly because of demand from parents who realize the benefits of a second language in bilingual Canada. Many jobs, especially in the federal public sector, require fluency in both languages, and as the kids themselves point out, there are other benefits besides job potential. Well, if you go to France or somewhere and, and learn, or somebody uh, um, tries to speak to you that you don't, that they don't know any English, you could communicate with them. So. So you like French? Yeah. Ryan? Yeah, I like French. French immersion teacher Suzanne Relic agrees. The kids really do like the second language. She calls her students enthusiastic learners who gobble up their lessons and says it's a challenge to keep them busy. But there are a few problems that come from learning lessons in a language the children aren't fluent in. It's not the same as teaching in English. Probably one of the big differences is at the beginning they don't understand a lot of what's going on. So you have to slow down a lot and keep that in mind. Um, a lot of your directions you have to slow down quite a bit and just assume that they don't know everything that you're saying right at first and a lot of times they won't tell you that right away so you just have to presume that um, you want to slow down a little bit for them. Now do you ever use anything but French in here? Would you revert to English on occasion? Not unless it was absolutely essential and then we try and do it with a puppet. We have an English puppet or an English hat that we'll put on and um, just to sort of remove our personality from the, the English-speaking side. But it, on occasion, there's something very important that has to be said, and you want to make sure that it's, it's come across and nothing is lost in the language. So would the kids who, t who are just starting off in French immersion without having a French language background, would they, be, would, they, would they sometimes lag behind the kids who are learning English, say in arithmetic or spelling or something? Um, the children in here don't learn to, don't start learning English formally at school until grade three it's introduced. So yes, I've had children who get quite frustrated in about grade two level when their friends in English are starting to learn to read the signs around town and, and can read books at home. And um, But they seem to catch up fairly quickly. A lot of the consonant sounds and, and vowel sounds are so similar that when they do start to read English, um, they click in really quickly. In the old days, schooling was a very solemn process. You don't have to be from the era of the one-room schoolhouse to remember classrooms as rather bare environments with few learning tools besides books and blackboards and perhaps the letters of the alphabet and a map or two pinned to the walls. That's a far cry from the classrooms of today, which are bright and colorful, the walls covered with pictures and cutouts, all designed to make learning fun and interesting rather than a ponderous, cold necessity. 
And a small change in the physical layout of some classrooms is the result of a much larger fundamental change in the philosophy of teaching. For generations, Canadian children went to school and sat in desks arranged in rows. Many classrooms in Prince Rupert are still arranged that way, each pupil a separate entity, linked to each other mostly by their common thread of attention to the teacher. But more and more, Prince Rupert classrooms are taking on a different seating arrangement. The desks are arranged in groups rather than individually. This promotes much more interaction between the students. And although graduates of the old school might see these classrooms as unorganized and without structure or discipline, that's apparently not so. The group seating arrangement is a small indicator of a relatively recent education process, a complete new way of teaching called the whole language learning program. It's a philosophy that emphasizes process rather than content. The children learn how to learn instead of simply learning a series of facts. Officials say it's shocking how many graduates of our education system are functionally illiterate. It's a problem the Sullivan Commission on Education in BC recognized and is trying to address. Proponents of the whole language learning program say this method of learning is much of the answer to deficiencies in the BC education system. What the Sullivan Commission on, on um, Education was telling us is that we need to focus in the school system on thinking skills and problem solving, um, that we need students who are able to think creatively and flexibly about problems. We need kids who can learn how to learn because children graduating from our school system need to be lifelong learners. We can no longer expect that um, what you know by the time you leave grade 12 is going to be enough for the rest of your life. Um, information is expanding at, at such a great rate that we need people who learn how to learn and, and can keep on learning as they go through life. So instead of the sort of philosophy that we may have had in the system 20 or 30 years ago where uh, we taught children how to memorize information, and regurgitate facts. Now we're we're trying to teach children how to gather information, how to solve problems, um, and how to think for themselves. Um, learning how to work with other people is a very important focus. Um, we want children who can work with whole pieces of information, um, such as uh, complete stories instead of word lists. Um, who can write projects and and think about problems that are important in the world today. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome back to Open Connection. Every teacher has her or his own style of teaching. And as traditional teaching methods evolve with the advent of differentiated instruction, more and more teachers are adjusting their approach depending on their students' learning needs. Let us return the archives to discover whole language learning. The whole language learning program started gaining acceptance in North America in the early 1980s. It developed out of new research that changed the way educators perceive the learning process. In effect, officials have learned more about learning, and so teaching methods are changing to keep up with the developments. Educators are finding that children learn an awful lot from each other, and so in a whole language classroom, it's often hard to pick out the teacher. Rather than being the focal point, standing at the head of the class, lecturing, the teacher is moving among groups of pupils, facilitating the learning process, but not dictating it. Whole language learning is cooperative learning. The children themselves kind of run the show, with the teachers mostly offering just guidance and assistance. The students take on the role of educator as well as learner. That's right. They learn from each other. They, they also learn from us, but we also learn from them. Um, it's very interesting to watch how students get concepts across to each other, and I think that's something that all teachers need to take, take a, a really close look at because they're very good teachers, and uh, they, they seem to know things that possibly that we, we should start to take into account. So, so will the, uh, older, the older kids, the kids in grade two, help out the grade ones? Yes, they do, all the time. And we have, uh, in, a, in a situation like this that they're working in right now, they're working in groups of three, and within each group there's two grade twos and a grade one student. And so the grade twos are helping the grade ones with things like spelling, um, but the grade ones have a lot of neat ideas that they're offering to, to that situation. Situation. So the grade ones aren't holding the grade twos back? No. Oh, definitely not, because the grade twos are very much involved in what they're doing as well. Uh, in reading situations, we, we pair the students up in a, in a buddy reading situation. The grade ones read what they can to the grade twos, and then the grade twos will read
to the grade ones, and when the grade ones are reading, if the grade twos, if they need help with a word, then the grade twos will help the grade ones with that particular word. So it's very much a helping, sharing, buddy kind of situation that happens there. There may be another benefit to having the students work cooperatively rather than individually. Besides learning more through the teamwork approach, the kids are apparently learning social skills. They're learning to get along with each other. Well, I think that co cooperation is really important in, in anything you do, whether it's your family life when you're old or the workforce. And there's skills that don't just happen. We don't learn. You just can't say go out and cooperate. So what's happening in the primary grades is where the kids are learning to work with each other and they're learning some of the cooperation lingo, such as I really liked your idea and maybe we could build on this idea. So as they learn these skills in the primary, what we're finding at the intermediate level, where I guess people tend to think of kids being a little more rowdy at the grade seven level, we're not seeing that happening because the children have already got those skills and they're learning, they've learned to work with each other. And I think that's really, um, been seen throughout the grade level and it's certainly you can't sort of start it in a grade 7 classroom and say okay we're going to do cooperative learning and let, we're all going to cooperate together. There's lots of teaching. The students have to learn the, the language of cooperation. Um, it's very structured in, in terms of playing roles and playing leadership and setting back and, and thinking. And if those things are done in the primary grades which are happening, at the intermediate level it just seems to fall into place. And we even find when new kids come to the school they just sort of seem to get sucked into it all yeah, and because the structure is already, already there, of cooperation. In the whole language program, the emphasis on finding the right answer is almost eliminated. The rigidity of marking achievement by having to answer correctly a prescribed set of questions is removed in favor of flexibility. Students are encouraged to follow their own interests, their own fields of strength. By removing the constraints of a mandatory curriculum, teachers say the pupils are free to grow without academic inhibitions. Personally, I find they do. Yeah, I do. I, uh, there's been some kids who have really caught my interest and I've watched for years now um, that came in where they were very unsure. Uh, they had to write it correctly and not make any errors in their spelling and uh, write neatly and write me a paragraph that was absolutely correct and to watch them take off and start really going through a process of understanding um, how to take a risk and try something else out new or to uh, experiment with different styles of writing um, to start to recognize what that is about catching that reader's interest and playing with it in their own piece. Without the fear of failure or something being black and white, right and wrong. That's right. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thematic learning is based on the idea that knowledge acquisition is efficient among students when they learn in the context of coherent and holistic way, and they can associate what they learn into their surrounding and real life examples. In this final segment of Open Connection, we return to the archives to discover how the Prince Rupert teachers engage their students' learning. A key element to the whole language program is the use of themes as a teaching tool. The class, and sometimes the entire school, adopts a theme, and all lessons revolve around that topic. In one school, large displays about the undersea world have been created by the students in the hallways and even under the stairwells. The students get more out of their lessons when they're based on a topic that grabs their interest. It's a fun way of learning. It makes learning fun, but yet meaningful. The kids can relate to, vis to a visit in a zoo. They can relate to, to bears. I mean, we have bears in this community. They can relate to that, and they can, they can study what, what is relative to them. And through the themes, they're actually learning, say if the theme is bears, they're actually learning more than just about bears. Oh, definitely. While the whole language learning program has been in use in some Prince Rupert schools for several years now, it's going to further spread throughout the province. The government has announced far-reaching changes to the province's education system, and this relatively new way of teaching is a cornerstone of the program. From kindergarten to grade three, pupils will advance at their own pace. There will be no achievement grading as we know it now. 
It's a bit of a gamble, this major overhaul of the education system, but those involved with the changes are confident it's the way of the future. We're not going to have to wait until students graduate from grade 12 to know whether or not we're on the right track. I think that we have a lot of um, research base to support what we're doing right now. Um, most of this research comes from researchers who are working in classroom settings with real children and real teachers, and um, this research is telling us that in order for children to um, be responsible in thinking about a problem, first we have to give them a problem, we have to give them an opportunity to practice what we want them to be able to do um, all the way through school. And, um, and so we do have that research base. So we have information, I think, that's telling us now that we're going in the right direction. Uh, we're not going to have to wait for judgment eight years down the line. When it's too late. That's right. And if you ask the teachers involved, there's no question whether the old or the new is the better method of teaching. Oh, whole language is much better. It's exciting. It's, it's fun. Um, the teacher gets more involved. Uh, 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 it's just fun. I can't say it any more simply. It's, it's fun. I love this kind of teaching. The implementation of whole language learning techniques are probably the most fundamental and far-reaching changes to occur in Prince Rupert schools in the past decade. But there's been lots of other changes as well. Computers have been around for a while now, mostly in the senior grades, but they're becoming more prevalent in the lower grades as well. The cost of computers precludes their use in every subject. The older students use them mostly for business courses, while the youngsters concentrate on writing skills. The computers are a valuable learning tool. They never run short on patience, they're motivational, and they're also just plain fun. Is it more fun to learn that sort of stuff on a computer or with a blackboard and a teacher? On the computer. Why is that? Because when you when the teacher is teaching you on the blackboard, it's sort of boring. And you get sort of tired and everything. And the value of being comfortable with computer technology isn't lost on the students, even those still in primary school. Yeah, I think everyone will probably at least use them in every job they get. It's like in, when, they, when you work at a grocery store, you use them in a cashier, they use them. And I think everyone will probably someday, someday use a computer. Now, this doesn't look like normal classroom activity. And this definitely isn't a regular school building. But it is where a school-sponsored educational program takes place. David McLean is getting some real-life work experience at a local building supply shop. He likes working with wood and thought it's a field he might want to make a career in. Through the school's work experience program, he gets an idea what employment in the field is like and whether he'll want to pursue it. Over 200 Prince Rupert businesses are involved in the program. What we try to do is have the employers make the, uh, the work experience as realistic as possible and uh, treat the students as if they were on probation. And uh, we, we put a lot of emphasis on preparing the students for coming in and, uh, and doing a, a, an honest day's work when they're in here. Changes in our educational system often come from subtle changes in attitude. Remember when a visit to the principal's office was bad news? When it meant a student was in some sort of trouble and had to see the principal for discipline? Often it meant a strapping in the bare, cold confines of the principal's office. Well, those days are gone. Instead of finding a strap in the office, students could find a treat in the bubblegum machine. The walls might be covered with carefree cartoon characters, and model airplanes hung from the ceiling all help to make the visit friendly and take the apprehension out of seeing the principal. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Oprah Connection. The greatest distance in the existence of man is not from here to there, but the connection from his mind to his heart. If we can conquer that distance, we soar like an eagle and realize our immensity within. I'm Robert Picktop. <laughs>